Good afternoon. This is Kathy Neifeld, one of the four partners at Agency One. Together with Ed Lesher, Dennis Bartos, and Gonzalo Garcia, I am honored to welcome you to the 2020 Agency One Annual Advisor Conference. This is the third week of the Agency One Virtual Advisor Conference and the second session for today. We still have two more weeks of phenomenal speakers and content to share with you. We hope that you have registered and will continue to attend the upcoming sessions. Thank you for joining us. Earlier today, we heard from Dr. Bob Bauer, Chief Global Economist with Principal Financial Group. The session provided great insight into the economy, the pandemic, the political landscape, and much more. If you missed that session or any of the sessions from the last two weeks, they have all been recorded and are available to you on the CVENTS site through the attendee hub. This afternoon, we are hosting a workshop on indexed universal life products and how understanding how the index works and also how upcoming changes to AG49 are going to impact your sales practices. Before I turn this over to Jim Williams, Regional Vice President with Securian Financial, I would like to thank Securian Financial for sponsoring this session. And I also have a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute. Please submit questions through the chat function in the attendee hub. The session will be recorded and a link to the recording will be made, of, will be made available after the session. And please do not forget to complete your session survey. Again, I would like to thank you all for being here today. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Jim. Take it away. Thank you, Kathy. Good afternoon. It, it, indeed, it is always good to be with our friends at Agency One and you, their producers, who they esteem so greatly. It's my distinct pleasure to greet you on behalf of Security and Financial and introduce two very distinguished speakers for this afternoon's program entitled Understanding the I in IUL Products and What Changes to AG49 Will Mean. First, let's talk about Tom Haynes, the Senior Vice President with the Nexus Group. Tom is responsible for index review and design at Anexus, manages the firm's relationships with index sponsors, investment banks, asset management firms, and leading academic experts. Tom was recently named to the Insured Retirement Institute's most influential leaders under 40 list. Prior to joining Anexus, Tom led equity solutions structuring at UBS Investment Bank and helped Anexus launch the award-winning New York Stock Exchange Zebra Edge Index. Tom's research on index products has been published in financial journals, and he served as a member of FINRA's Investment Management Committee. Tom has a bachelor's degree in quantitative finance from James Madison University in Virginia. And then following Tom on our program today is Alan Sukerman, and he is a national life director with Anexus who works with independent distribution companies within the life insurance industry and helps to lead them to success in sales and marketing through better education and product designs. Alan believes that with better confidence in product knowledge and the markets your product serves, you will positively influence the business and lives of independent insurance advisors and your clients. Alan has been successful in launching and marketing the most consumer intuitive IUL product to be released in many years. Within 18 months, it achieved sales profitability and revolutionized the IUL marketplace. Alan was an original member of the Society of Senior Advisors and holds his MBA in business marketing as well. He is also an alumni of North Dakota State University where he was a member of the sports medicine department and served the national championship football program. Alan resides in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he leads the sales efforts of the life insurance division of the Annexus Group. We all hope you enjoy today's presentation, and I hope to see you in our virtual exhibit hall booth tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern. And now I will turn it over to Tom. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining, uh, and I really appreciate uh, Jim, for those kind words, and for Kathy and Gonzalo and the Agency One team to, to bring us together. So we really appreciate it, the partnership from an Annexus perspective, as well with our carrier partners that you work with at Securian and Nationwide, uh, that have been two tremendous mutual carrier partners. With, and I think that, that that is such a key part 
of having trusted mutual partners when we think about trying to sort of best for our client. And uh, it, it's, it's funny, you know, Al will talk about the AG49 changes and how I bet many of your other carriers, partners that use are probably in a bit of a panic. Oh, what do we do? And for us, it's actually been a fairly seamless process uh, because our carrier partners with us have always been really trying to do the client right as long as we can. So we've been really, in some ways, ready for this day to come. Um, but today, what I want to talk about is smart beta indices. And that's been such an evolution uh, within the IUL market. It's been in the FI market for 10 years. So for myself, it's really been my whole career. I've been creating trading indices, creating indices for financial products, as well as even proprietary opportunities. But as we think about this life and annuity market and this evolution, there has to be a process to this madness. I think in this market, there's probably about a dozen smart beta indices. Anyone can build a good backtest, but is the index gonna work on a go forward basis? And that's what my job is. So our, in Scottsdale, Arizona is the headquarters for Nexus. I'm actually based here in North Jersey. My role obviously with COVID, it's been a little bit different, but I'm going into the New York City area often, meeting investment banks, index firms, our academic partners up the Northeast seaboard. That's Roger Ibbotson, the, fa the father of Zebra Capital Management, and I see Zebra Edge Index in Yale University. Uh, we work with Dr. Schiller or in Philadelphia, Jeremy Siegel. So I'm very much on the road on the Amtrak, working with our carrier partners, and also going in New York City, having straight to straight talks with investment banks to ensure that these products are getting the best hedge pricing in with the carrier to ultimately get you a good competitive price par rate with these products. So that's what really a little bit about my role. And in that process, that's a due diligence process. Sounds like a little bit of negotiation too, but it's a due diligence process. And we do evaluate every index. We're just not going to stick an index on a product. The first step we do is we're going to interview. We're going to talk about that. We're going to interview the designer of the index to understand what's the impetus of why they're building that index. Are they doing it to just make a buck or they actually have some academic sound theories driving it, some passion of why they are so proud to build an index. We'll talk about that. We're going to talk about determine. And we're we'll determine is this index going to be a fit for the product and how we're going to go through that. So that's part of today's discussion. And then select. Select to ensure we work very closely with our carrier partners at Security and Nationwide to ensure that the product's just not an academic exercise, to ensure that it has the integrity of work on a go forward basis, but to make sure, as I said earlier, that it's going to be able to offer those strong par rates, not just now, but on a renewal basis as well. So when the first step of that, that wheel, I said interview. We sit down and over a face-to-face -face conversation, you can learn so much about the integrity of a person and the process of why we're looking at this smart beta index. And uh, you don't need to have a quantitative finance degree for that. It's usually something that's just over human interaction. Unfortunately, you can uncover some really sad stories in our marketplace, but it helps us weed out weed out the, the deception in the marketplace and focus on quality, quality partners. So where have we been? You know, many of you are using IULs that just use S&P 500. So if you're looking at S&P 500 chassis one with carrier A, S&P 500 two IUL, obviously there's all those buy up rights and that's what, you know, I'll talk about the HE49 changes. But other than that, the chassis, you were looking at chassis A and chassis B, but it had a common denominator, the index. So illustrations were able to give you guidance, right, to a certain extent. Uh, then smart beta came. And a lot of times, it's unfortunate, the agents using the product, they think, well, okay, I'm going to continue to use uh, maybe a ledger page. I get with AG49 restrictions, but a ledger page to see how will this index fit into the IUL product. And by the way, it has the letterhead of the insurance company on there. So it must have been diligence by the insurance company. That's not the case. What's happened with these smart beta indices is there's about a dozen Wall Street banks that are not fiduciaries. To be a Wall Street trader or banker, you're not a fiduciary, you're a broker dealer. And what they do is they go out to insurance companies and their ultimate goal is to create balance sheet trades from their balance sheet to hedge the liabilities of the insurance company. And that's what they're paid. They're paid on trades. They're not paid on assets. They're not paid on client performance. They're paid on trades. So as a result of that, and it's such a competitive business, you have the brightest people around the world are fighting this. They go to schools, uh, top schools around the world, 
and some of them aren't even from America. And that's not, that's not a, a, a negative remark, but what they do is they come here for a few years. They're called expats. So they've been sent by a European bank to try to get a deal or two in the US marketplace with some slick financial engineered strategy and go back home. And then they can tap that, yes, they made it in New York, they can make it anywhere. And a lot of times in this competitive business and people trying to li live off seven figure salaries in New York City, the cost of preschool in New York City is $35,000. $35,000 in New York City. For me, it's about my, for my kids, it's about 3,000 New Jersey. So think about that lifestyle. Just to send two or three kids to preschool in New York City and live a life, it costs a lot of money. So it's a cutthroat business. And if you don't get a deal in a year, you're out of a job. So what happens? A lot of times bankers, not all the time, but many times they sacrifice moral principles and they create indices that are heavily data mined and cherry picked to make a good back test that is gonna work on a go forward basis. And that's what we need to do. And unfortunately, the insurance company doesn't look through the process all the time because who is tasked with that insurance company? An actuary. They're the most quantitative person in that organization. Actuaries are really good at understanding mortality and longevity risk, but they're not necessarily trained on investment strategies. So all too often, that actuary picks the index that illustrates the best. And here we go. We're in this, 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 with this false prophecy thinking that the illustration were going to work. Don't trust the illustration to start with that. And I'm not saying, oh, now AG 49 is going away. We're getting a new illustration. Don't trust the illustrations. Start to think about how indices are going to work on a go forward basis. So related to that interview process, when I joined the Nexus three years ago, all the firms began to pitch me. How, why, oh, put my index in your product. Securian, Nationwide, and annuity products, because we want to do business. So during this process in 2017, this is right when I joined an excess, every, I sat down with every bank, and I want to share with you some true quotes that were told to me that are pretty eye-opening, and hence why we need a diligence process. Don't repeat this, but we are aware of the poor structuring design that we made in designing index XYZ in the annuity market. And that index is still in the market, but we fixed it in this prototype we're trying to pitch you today, Tom, in the Nexus. And when I heard that, I didn't ask the question. It was volunteered to me. When I heard that, I said, where's the recall function? If I was in the automobile industry and I worked at Ford Motor, how would I feel if an airbag manufacturer came in and said, we have faulty airbags on the crisis, but we fixed them for you, Ford? What about the good of the American people? What about the good of our industry? And unfortunately, that index was in the market way too long and suffered very poor performance. And you know what happened to that person? She got promoted to managing director, not because of the performance of the index, but they got sales and that's what they're paid for. What about this one? I'm sitting at a lunch in New York three years ago and I get presented an index. And the index has a lot of bond allocation. And I say to the person as a managing director, how would this work in a rising rate environment? And the person said to me, Tom, marketers don't care about go forward performance. They only care about back testing. Well, that's not the case because maybe that's how it's pitched, but we have to care how it's going to perform. That's not a type of index partner. We designed the index now to drive sales today in 2017, this was, but we know the strategy will perform poorly to probably 2001. There was an index in the annuity market and it was getting a lot of sales success. And the, the bank wanted us at a nexus to take on a very similar trade and index. So I looked at it and I looked way back. I actually got data using my Bloomberg from the 1990s. And I saw the index wasn't holding up in the 90s. During the tech bubble, it was falling apart. During the tech burst, it was falling apart. It only really did well in the last decade. So I shared that data with the bank and I said, what's going on? Did I make an error? They came back to me and they said this that we designed the index to drive sales now. That was in 2017 when the S&P volatility was the lowest in decades. What about how is it going to work in a rising interest rate environment? Or how is it going to work in a COVID environment? We didn't predict COVID, but look at what happened to market volatility. Can I tell you that index that was already out in the market, the drive was built for sales in 2017, was down 30% in 2020? Yes. It wasn't prepared for COVID. I'm not saying it could have predicted COVID, but we need to have indices that really are not meant to home, hit home runs every year, but that really can hit singles and doubles. That's the goal and really a mindset of a nexus coupled with building those indices with academic integrity. 
And then I went and buy the strategy personally. I was in an industry event, this was five years ago, and a managing director, Yale educated lawyer, he won a deal with his bank's US brand, a huge brand that everyone would know in the line with a major insurance company, everyone would know in the line, and they put this index in the product. I went up and congratulated the man on his deal. That's all I did, congratulations. And he said that to me. I wouldn't buy the strategy personally. How could a lawyer, a managing director lawyer in a major US investment bank say that? Wouldn't he have the gumption to put the brakes and say, I'm, I don't think our bank wants to affiliate with that deal. I don't feel comfortable. So that's why we do an interview process. That's why I live in the New York area and go in and face to face, we really get to filter out the people that we don't wanna work with. And it doesn't just stop with just some offline remarks and investment banks that I've dealt with. These are public issues of quantitative driven strategies over the last decade from the asset management industry mostly, not really the insurance industry, even though it's the AXA, but that was an investment management issue. These are fraud, some of these are fraudulent issues that were poorly designed indices, misleading back tests, the name goes on. Some of them have felt, have gone with major SEC fines, two of them, three of them in particular, SEC fines. So even a Bible ETF could be accused of making misleading claims. So my point is, as we go into the next decade, I don't know who's going to be the next Mr. Rosenberg to hide errors in his model or Howard President F squared or the next social governance ETF to kind of fake a performance number just to get more sales. But they're going to happen. And that's deception. And that's part of the process, the interview process to weed out that deception. So we're focused on making sure we're getting the best for our clients on a go forward basis. So that begins to the next point is determination, determined. And I said, that's part of the list. So what do I mean by determined? Do the indices perform? I do, you keep on hearing me say, I don't care about the back test. I care about go forward performance, but we do want to understand how the indices performed historically. Are there issues, red flags? And what I mean perform, I don't mean the last decade to the point I raised earlier. How did the last 20 years or 30 years? We want to understand how they perform in numerous market conditions. Do the indices complement each other? Let's not just think we're gonna put our chips in one index. Unfortunately, many of you in the IO market have only been given one index, the S&P 500. And we're gonna talk about that in the today. We need to have numerous indices that complement each other. It's so important. Do the indices protect? At Nexus, we really believe in the value of multi-year uncapped strategies. We offer one-year strategies, and you'll see that from working with Al and the like, but we want to have indices that have good protection mechanisms so that they have the confidence to go out longer and harness the benefit of those higher participation rates. But if we have indices that are wild, wild cowboy rides, that's not going to work. You're not going to have the confidence to want to do that with us. So we want to ensure that the indices have protection mechanisms embedded in them that are able to pivot out tactically, like the S&P PRISM index that I built with S&P or Zebra Edge with Roger Ibbotson I also built or Moe's. Are the indices a fit for the product? Sometimes you can have the best index and it makes the most sense, uh, but does it really offer competitive par rates? Does it offer competitive renewal rates? We have, does it have scalability? You know, or is this a, a one trick pony for 2017 and after wise the renewal rates will be all over the place. We don't want that either. We don't drive indices to drive par rates for sales now. We also pick indices to have stable par rates for those next 20, 30 years that your clients are in this. And is the fit of a product a fit for the portfolio? As many of you deal with higher net worth clients, some of you might be in premium financing. In these situations, we know that you're not the only game in town. The client has a whole portfolio, maybe ultra high net worth clients, it's real estate, maybe it's, a, it's probably a securities allocation. We have to understand. And I don't necessarily have that crystal ball and lens because that's more bespoke to your client. But we do think about how these products fit generally within a portfolio and is it a fit? And then does the product work on a go forward basis? That's probably the point you're gonna hear with me talking about the most today. How does this work on a go forward basis? Because it's not about the last decade, it's about the next decade and the decade after in the case of an IUL and even the decade after. So to transition, I know you had an economist around lunchtime this, talk to you, I'm going to give you a little bit of market perspective. So a lot of people say you can't forecast markets, but we're actually going to talk to you a little bit about how you can in a long-term basis. But to start with, look at this. You know, 
using the illustrations, you'd say the S&P 500 did 13.6% returns with dividends in the, decade, the last decade. It, it killed the European markets and gold was on a tear and commodities get lost. They were a losing trade. Do you really want to base a decision off of that? And why do I call it the dumb S&P 500? Let's get to that. The reason I call it the dumb S&P 500, this is a benchmark. It's a fine benchmark, but is it a, something that you should put in a financial product? I don't know. I really question it. The finance, how the S&P works is the stocks that get better and, and up in price and the up in market value, they get higher weights. And they really don't have any way to correct for that until it's too late and we have a bubble. The S&P is prone to bubbles. It's been the case for many bubbles, 1980 energy bubble, 1999 tech bubble. Even in the financial crisis, it was getting a little heavy on, on financial stocks. And then now, this is the biggest bubble in my lifetime. You, I heard that Jim made the remark I was youngest under 40. I'm over 40 now, so I'm, I'm past that hurdle over the, uh, over the hump there. And in my 40 years of life, the S&P 500 has the biggest concentration of having five names represent now 26% of the weight of the index this summer. That's higher than it's been in the tech bubble in 1980. You really want to put yourself in a retirement product that has five names taking over a quarter of the allocation? Does that make sense? That feels like a bet and it feels like a dumb bet. And maybe bets work, right? Bets can work. You could go to Atlantic City and go on the roulette wheel or Vegas and make a lot of money, but they can also go the wrong way. And if you're in the retirement planning business or if you're using premium financing with a very structured transaction, you don't wanna be taking bets. The product isn't set up to do that. You want to have a think about diversity and, and also a go forward mindset. So when we think about the forecast for the decade ahead, and these aren't my forecasts, this is Wall Street forecasts. Specifically, we got these from research affiliates and JP Morgan Asset Management following COVID-19's kind of market craziness. So these are from the summer. Look at it. Dumb S&P. These aren't mine. This is Wall Street saying 2.5% for the next decade per annum. You take away dividends, that's 50 basis points a year. How's it, how are you going to be able to, to make money off the IUL if you have an S&P IUL and Wall Street's forecasting 50 basis points a year? You're not. You just aren't. You're going to probably lose money in some of these products. And then we think about small caps in Japan. There's better opportunities in Europe and Japan. But yet people don't learn there because the last decade wasn't too good. But the next day, we're not talking about the last decade. It's over. We have to have indices that can get you that global exposure. That if the, the product not to be crude is naked without it. And then commodities. Commodities are the best inflationary hedge you can have. So if you have an index without any commodities exposure and you're doing a premium finance transaction, good luck. You have a floating interest rate and then your next, you know, rates go up because of inflation and, and your index isn't keeping up, especially if you pick the smart beta index and just with data mined with bonds. So what are you going to do? That's why we think about a go forward mindset. And it's not about having a crystal ball. The whole point of this, as Jack Bogle actually said, is to create realistic expectations. Anyone that tells you with a straight answer, the this index or fund or product is going to do specifically that, don't trust them. Walk away. But when they're using it to create more realistic expectations on a forward basis, that's why we do it. And you know that, that actually, this is from Jack Bogle's last interview ever in, with Morningstar on October 19. 2018, I should say, before he got too sick and died that following winter. And when we think about the bond market, the reason why we talk about it is a lot of smart beta indices that are coming out the pipe. You heard me on S&P, but there's these smart beta indices and they're just loaded up with bond exposure. What's the point of saying an IOL is an alt from a product, it's a bond all and so forth, then the index just loads up in bonds? That's not, that's not a good idea. What about taking a premium finance case where you load up on all this bond exposure and index and then you have an a variable floating interest rate? I've never heard anyone take out a loan to buy more bond exposure. That's crazy. But that's what you're doing if you're buying an index IUL that tracks bond allocations heavily. And where are the bond forecasts today? You don't have to have a degree in quantitative finance and you don't have to have a crystal ball. There's one driving factor to forecast bound returns, and that's the current level of interest rates. And we know where they are right now. The 10-year yield is below 80 basis points today. That means that the 10-year bond on the forward basis for the next decade is around 80 basis points. That's nothing left. There's nothing left in the bond market. So that's why we have this 
thought process. And to think that bonds can continue to work well, it's foolish. So we want to make sure our indices, they can include bonds, but we want to make sure our indices can propel away from bonds in a rising rate environment. And then also that they use allocations to other strategies that work on a go forward basis, like international markets and smart, smart beta in the United States market, and even commodities to ensure that we're earning positive returns because there's just nothing left here. What do we do at Indexis? We believe, and we do it with all of our carrier partners, security and nationwide, is academic excellence and verification. We work with index providers that build their indices with an academic robust sound work, framework, just like the scientific method. This is a science. This is a science. And when we make sure our academic partners are building the indices on that robust research, and we want to make sure that things work on a go forward basis. So with, with that, um, many of you are probably aware with our security and BGA product, there is the S&P Prism Index. And that's a that's been a very special um, partnership for us. I actually built the Prism Index and we worked at a Nexus. It's a partnership with S&P. Uh, S&P owns and calculates the index and they did, they did the diligence on the index and saw the value of it. So as much as I talk about the dumb S&P for the decade ahead and the 26% exposure, we're gonna take the S&P, but we're gonna put it, make it a smart tactical framework. And to say that S&P is a partner of ours on that, is very powerful and we're really proud of that partnership. So S&P Prism is able to tactically allocate against S&P bonds and commodities using numerous signals. And it's now been live since August, uh, April of 2018 in the product. So just some remarks on it. It's the only index to my knowledge built solely for the IOL market. Uh, S&P Prism is not an NFIA product. And I can tell you, when I look at the smart beta indices in the market, many times, and we do, we have some with Nationwide that work, like Zebra and Mosaic, and we diligence to make sure it fit into IOL. So I'm not saying anything wrong with it, but I do know because I build it, I build it specifically for security, for that chassis, knowing that we needed a product to still use S&P, because that's familiar with your client base, but to tactically get out of that when we have volatile and bad market situations to be able to use commodities in inflationary environments. So it was the only index built for the IO market. We're using smart US S&P allocations here, provided by S&P. We're not walking away from S&P, we're partnering with them. So it's a very special partnership, as I said. It is a 28% correlation to the S&P. So as I talked about complement, why put all your eggs in one basket? Well, in the security and product, you can still allocate to the S&P 500, if you want, and for my concerns with it, but then you can also still complement. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So that allows for diversification. Same thing with our new heights, IUL. That's why we have Zebra Edge, a smart way to get US equity exposure, not a dumb way, built by the behavior of researcher Roger Ibbotson and the stewardship of having the New York Stock Exchange calculate it, and going global with the Mosaic 2 index. Remember, as I said, going global and commodities have the better effect for the decade ahead. That's what Mosaic 2 brings and a smarter S&P exposure. But we have a zigzag. All too often, you're just given one choice in an IUL. Roll the dice. That's not what we want to do in retirement planning. A comprehensive strategy using numerous sound indicators. We don't want to have an index where the index is uh, just picked on one indicator. It's like going to the doctor for a comprehensive physical and you're only going to get your temperature taken and said you're good. You wouldn't feel good about your doctor doing that and nor should a financial strategy do that to you and your clients. You need to make sure there's numerous robust indicators managing the allocations of those assets. And built for numerous market conditions, hence the reason why we look at numerous indicators. It's not a, just about the last decade. It's one of the reasons I'll talk about in a bit why PRISM has done so well going through this COVID-19 volatility and crisis. Inflation control, I've already said it a few times. It's so important especially if you do premium financing, to have indices that have allocations to commodities. Because otherwise, if interest rates go up because of inflation, what's going to be offsetting that trade? Have you just bought an S&P exposure and interest rates grow, drive up uh, the cost of S&P options and now your par rates are down there? That's not good. Or have you allocated to a smart beta index that was data mined? 
and it's 70% bond allocation and it can't get out of uh, the asset class appropriately. And now you're, you're, you've, you've taken what we call a Texas hedge in the bond market. It's the last thing you wanna do. So in terms of performance of PRISM for this year, um, over the last 12 months, I should say, it's up 7.46%. And this is on a raw basis. This is before you put in, let's say that there's, there's really strong par rates uh, that Al and the sales team can talk about. Really solid. And this is through COVID-19, through COVID-19. Actually, PRISM was able to get out of the equity market 23rd, 24th of December. It started to see an inflationary environment persist what we call is an inverted yield curve. It predicted nine out of the last 10 recessions going into this one. And it was the first index in, I believe, the smart beta marketplace that was able to say, if we have an inverted yield curve for nine months, we're gonna pivot and pull out of equities. And at the same time, it knew the bond market was a little scared. So it got out of the 24th of December. So it didn't predict COVID, but my point is we were gonna go into a recession no matter what. I really believe we were doomed for a recession going into 2020, COVID-19 obviously was what happened. And if anything, probably all the Fed inflation, the Federal Reserve intervention actually mitigated the recession that we were doomed to go into. And through all that, here PRISM was still able to prevail. So we can, we're cautious on bonds. It has a very small bond allocation. There's nothing left. And that's how the index in a rules-based manner does this. And to my point, because it was able to be very defensive and kind of foresee that we're going into recession, even though it wasn't a COVID predictor, it didn't take, take it didn't get hit hit so hard. So when markets started to recover, co the index wasn't scared. It was able to get back into the markets and participate. Hence, why still after a whole trailing twelve months, our raw index performance is up around seven and a half percent. And then, you know, versus renewal rate strategies, S&P basic strategies, the volatility on this thing has been really stable. It's had positive performance and stable volatility. The benefit of that is securing, and the same with the zebra edge and the mosaic. They were able to, they're able to get stable participation rates, stable hedge prices, unlike riding the roller coaster of S&P par rates, where you give up, which is a part of what we said, select to make sure it's not an academic exercise, but it's truly implementable. So with that being said, I, uh, I really want to thank everyone for, for their, their time and for in, inviting me on from Agency One and our partnerships with uh, uh, Sec Securian and Nationwide today. And if you obviously have questions, we're always willing to, to field those uh, th through Agency One and, and Alan, the sales director team. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Sure, appreciate that. And uh, what, a, what a great presentation. You know, it's not often, particularly as an advisor, that you actually get to have a session with someone who designs indices and builds product and does that. And I sure appreciate your expertise, Tom, and taking the time today. We're, we're so proud to have you on the team. I also, again, want to thank the folks at uh, Securian, Jimmy Williams, uh, and the team at uh, Securian, who's been a great partner and was our original partner at Anexus on the IUL space as, as Tom has talked about, and also our, the folks at Nationwide. We're gonna to focus today primarily on our Securian product, but the folks at Nationwide and the IUL we have there, I know that every one of you have, have heard from Gonzalo and Kathy and Stark and, and Larkins and the whole team at Agency One uh, regarding that product as well. So what do we wanna talk about today? Again, you got a great indication uh, from Tom uh, with regards to uh, PRISM and the diligence that actually goes into an indice. And many of those themes that Tom talked about, we're gonna revisit in just a little different way again. We're gonna talk about the effects of regulatory changes that are coming down the pike and actually uh, will be mandated effective December 14th. And we're getting out ahead of those and giving you the education on it early. We're gonna make any changes early, but the great thing about it is our product particularly our Securian product at Anexus was built right the first time. We are not having to make wholesale changes in our product in order to accommodate for the reworking of regulation AG49, now being called 49A. And that's the great uh, idea through this. AG49, the original regulation kind of set a baseline for expectations. That came into effect somewhere around September of 2015. 
the real driver to that was to create a catalyst for product innovation to level the playing field in terms of the illustration war that was going on. The problem is there wasn't much innovation in the industry. Products were all kind of created the same and they all kind of had the same feel. And one of the things when we went into building this product originally, and we've maintained this mindset at a nexus is, do we have the best illustration or do we take that fiduciary hat and what do what's best for the consumer? And as Tom talked about, it's not what back tests well or shows on an illustration well, it's about what performs in the real market net to the consumer. How do we get a better consumer outcome? And that's the differentiator really when you talk about a Nexus product. So many of those in the marketplace have laden their products with multipliers and buy up options and huge loan arbitrages. We at a Nexus have never believed that that's the way that a product should be developed and that's the way it should go to market. And the result of that is you're now starting to see some very significant class action lawsuits in and around all any or all of those topics. We have stayed above that fray and our development and diligence and index design that Tom talked about all lend to that exact topic. Well, as a result of all that, AG49 and the industry has said, we need to make some additional changes. We need to fix some things. And so effective December 14th of 2020, many of those multipliers, those buy-up options, and those enhancements that you see in, most, in many of the illustrations in, in, in the industry, they're not gonna be able to show a significant difference anymore in their values. And the goal of 49A is to kind of do that reboot that Tom was just talking about. How do you do a recall? Well, the NAIC is kind of doing a recall and saying we're going to change the rules of the game. The problem is anytime you change rules, it just opens up more loopholes or different loopholes. So the game isn't going to entirely change. You're still going to see illustration games with carriers you're just going to see them in a little different place. But what is happening is that loan arbitrage has been dropped from an illustrative maximum to, to, of one to an illustrative maximum of 50 basis points. But when you do that, remember that you're giving up 50 basis points on that loan arbitrage illustration. That's going to make illustrative numbers be reduced. And there's no way around that. Everybody's illustration after December 14th will look a little bit different than the illustration does say today. And, and that's the way that's gonna look going forward. The industry will react in one of a few ways. It's gonna react with doing more of the same just as it's been doing. They're gonna totally redesign the product, but many companies are gonna ask for that proverbial Melligan. And, and, and they're going to have an entirely different story. By first quarter of next year, you're going to see many in the industry completely redesign products. They're going to take a little different road to get to the end result. A Nexus has not done that. A Nexus has retained its original story, and we have not had wholesale changes to our product. It was designed right the first time. And that's a story, as Tom talked about, in the diligence process, we are so proud. Whether it's the security story or the nationwide story, the story has changed, it has never changed in our products. It never was about the illustration. It was always about the low expenses, the low fees, the construction of the product. And then a, because the goal was, can we achieve illustrated rate or better more often? What is that probability? And when you look at the industry response, you see many of the top carriers that many of you probably are using. And they are the highly, many of them highly leveraged products. Spreads have gone to double digits. Uh, caps has, have come down and are coming down even further. But yet the illustrated rates have remained the same in many cases. And you'll even see under 49A, the ability for some of these carriers to actually even 
increase their illustrated rates. And that's one of those areas where those carriers that are used to pushing the envelope and leveraging contracts, the ability now, one of those loopholes is in how that illustrated rate can be calculated using different general assets of the company. That's going to be one of those games. You'll want to talk with Kathy and Gonzalo and, and Ed Stark and the entire team at Agency One to get a little more insight as to what are some of those games that you'll have to look at. But again, not an illustrated illustration game, but a probability game of the stability uh, going forward. So when you look at the Annexus response, how are we adapting to this new regulation? Well, the philosophy has always been about better consumer outcomes. And in those better consumer outcomes, we've had 15 years as a company, whether it be in the FIA space or the IUL space, of very consistent and proven track records. It's never been about that illustration. We've set achievable advisor and client expectations. Are we more likely than not to achieve illustrated rate or better? And it, why is that due to design and index diligence. Proper due diligence, of course, in product design and indexing, and we never want to be putting you as an advisor or, or as a client having to apologize to them for underperformance on a regular basis. Of course, there can be single individual years, but on a looking going forward basis, on a year over year, multi, multiple years, the decades and subsequent decades, are we producing as good or better than the illustration going forward. It was built right the first time, and that's the essence of the changes uh, that we have been able to bring. So Balanced Growth Accumulator 2, that's the product with Securian that we highlight, and that is the Annexus product. Again, uh, Tom talked about the index, and we'll get into that here in just a moment, but the changes to the crediting. And many of you that are familiar with that product know that starting in the 11th year, we had up to a one and a half percent credit uh, that was credited uh, looking back uh, to the returns. That credit has changed. It's now been reduced to 0.57, 57 basis points, again, starting in year 11, but applies to the accumulated value, the accumulation value in the contract, not calculated off of rate of return. And it applies to all policies in force. It pays annually and does not apply to loans. Again, that 50 basis point change in the illustrative capability, we think this will actually make a positive difference in your uh, policies on a, on a new basis, as well as a going forward basis. That product, and that is the sole change to the product as a result of 49A. It is not a huge change. It does not change the product in its essence. The goal of, of BGA, as we call it, the acronym BGA2, again, those proprietary IUL product, available only to a limited number of organizations like Agency One, and therefore a limited number of advisors. As Tom talked about performing in a variety of market conditions, having not just that S&P concept, but also bonds and the commodities make it uniquely different, able to perform in a variety of market conditions. Of course, that ability to pay partial index credits. This is one of those areas that we actually hold the patents. We hold patents around this calculation. And that's the notion of paying interest on expenses that come out of the contract. Very unique. It's the only IUL product in the marketplace that we know of that calculates it this way and actually credits it real time to the contract. And of course, the innovative uncapped strategies. Our products at Annexus are uncapped all the time by contract. They never can be capped. So you combine the low expenses, uncapped, high participation rates, and you really have that diligence and recipe for having a better outcome to the consumer. And those that index crediting strategy, of course, as Tom talked about, is S&P Prism. He was the designer of it, along in conjunction with the S&P Corp Global Corporation, and we know that the returns of the S&P have withstood the test of time. You see the dot-com bubble, the financial crisis, and the bull market. But you see PRISM in a very, very narrow band of returns. You don't see the big peaks and the big valleys. That consistency of returns, whether you're in a bull market or a bear market, lends very well to a product that has expenses 
on a continuum basis. And overall, we are able to create a very low volatility, but a marketable rate of return. And that's as the raw market. When you now take those raw market returns and you plug it into the par rates of the product, you have a situation that does extremely well and extremely consistent. And it really is about that consistency. Tom talked about the returns of the S&P being around 13 and a half, 13.6 over the last 10 years. But the investment banks that we talk to, that we work with on a regular basis, we interviewed them. In fact, not we, Tom interviewed them. And the consensus from those banks is they believe that the market is not going to be in the next 10 the way the returns have been in the last 10. In fact, they think it'll be maybe somewhere in the four to six range, maybe not even. And when you think about that, and you think about those layers of expenses that we looked at just a little bit ago, in terms of asset charges, strategy charges, uh, spreads and caps, you see that you actually are in a negative rate environment. But when we look at PRISM on a year over year basis in 2020, January of 19 to January 2020, and so on, February 19 to 2020, you see the actual segment, one year segment returns of PRISM. It has been extremely consistent and it has performed very, very well. During these same periods, look where the S&P was. Yet PRISM was very, very consistent. And that's the diligence and the forecasted for, forward looking kind of model that Tom in conjunction with the S&P Global Corporation designed when you talk about PRISM. It's been very, very effective. It gives you a great flexibility and alternative to be naked in, the, in what Tom referred to as the dumb S&P, meaning the full S&P with no mitigation. You're buying the good stuff with the bad stuff because you're in the index. So when we look at that and we look at what is 49A and the implementation of 49A, we're looking at a date of February, uh, November 20th. November 20th is when the current product will no longer be available. You will not be able to illustrate it and it will not be available to sell after the 20th. Effective Saturday the 21st, all illustrations will be 49A compliant, meaning you'll see that 50 basis point. You'll see that, that uh, uh, the bonus the, that we have starting the 11th year moved to the accumulation value of the contract. That will be effective at noon central time on Saturday, November 21st. So if you're running illustrations and you're, you're uh, illustrating and presenting this product, make sure you have that ran and saved in your system or through end of business, November 20th. Because on the 21st, you will not be able to go back and create a new illustration. And then Friday, December 11th, guys, this is the drop dead date, regulatory reason. All cases must be placed on the old product or what we know today to be the current product. All cases must be fully underwritten, approved, paid, and delivered by close of business Friday, December 11th. So if you have illustrations out there, you have proposals out there, get those apps written, get them in, but they have to be paid and delivered by December 11th. That is the drop dead date. So on my Annexus right now, all of you should probably be familiar with my Annexus. If not, talk to the folks at Agency One. You will have the transition guidelines that we just went over and all of the material around the AG49A adaptations and changes that have gone on. And that uh, will be available for you or Gonzalo and the team at Agency One can get those to you, but those are out there today. They're available for you today and you'll want to utilize that. So, and with that, again, thanks for attending today's session. Um, and I will turn it back over to Kathy uh, to wrap up for you and, and open up a question Q and A session. Uh, thank you, Alan, that was terrific. And also to Tom, if anybody has any questions, I'd like to remind you, please type them, type them into the chat box and we will be happy to address them. I do have a question for you, Alan. I hope you're still on the line. And that is about the bonus that you talked about. Is that, uh, is the 57 
uh, basis point bonus guaranteed? And if not, is there some guaranteed bonus rate? It is not guaranteed. And at Securian, uh, the bonus rate that is currently in place is also not guaranteed. However, uh, Securian in, in the last 50 years has never missed that bonus. They have paid it every single year for the last 50 years. Okay. Um, under the new AG49 guidelines, is it possible to run illustrations now using the new guidelines? It is not. Uh, the new illustration system uh, for Securian will be live on, on um, live for agency one on November 23rd. Uh, after November 29th, next Thursday, it will then uh, be available for advisors directly on my MX. You mean October, not November, right? That's what I meant. I'm sorry. October. That's okay. Uh, you're, you're pushing Thanksgiving. It's okay. I like Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> Uh, another question that came in, do you foresee the Annexus PRISM 500 being offered with other carriers? Now, the, the um, PRISM index was developed and is under contract directly with Securian. And we don't put that particular, uh, that index on any other product. It is unique uh, to Securian. Just as Zebra, Roger Ibbotson's index, Zebra Capital, and JP Morgan Mosaic 2 that's on our nationwide product, those indices are unique and will only be on those products. They cannot go to another carrier under current contracts. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, once again, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. Uh, right now, I don't see any others. So, um, with, oh, we've got another one, here we go. Is arbitrage over 1% still based on the market return? Well, that's part of the calculation. The interesting part about, uh, again, AG49 rates uh, is that uh, returns were one, one aspect. It was the average return of the general account uh, and also of their standard capped S&P allocation. One of the changes uh, and I don't want to get into this probably in too much detail this morning, but this afternoon, but one of the changes under 49A is carriers can now reclassify the assets they're using to determine that part of that calculation. In other words, they can change the assets that they're going to segment for the purposes of that calculation. And so you will see some carriers who are going to segment certain assets from the general account and that's going to be their AG49A segmented illustrated rate kind of uh, assets. And you will see some interesting things happen, just as you saw interesting things with multipliers and bonuses and all that. That's the part of this game that you're really going to have to understand when you'll see an outlier for rates. And, and that's, again, the game is going to continue. It's just going to look different. Thank you, Alan. Another question that had come in earlier that um, Tom had answered privately, but for those of you that were wondering uh, what the answer was, the question was, what is your source for 10-year projection of dumb S&P? And Tom had responded, research affiliates and JP Morgan asset management. Uh, so there's some additional information there. Uh, we are at 354 and I do not see any other questions? So with that, I would like to thank Tom Haynes and Alan Zuckerman and our friends at Securian for sponsoring uh, this session and for all of the information that was provided. Uh, a few reminders. Um, number one, please fill out your surveys. They'll be emailed to you sometime this afternoon. And uh, once again, agency, will, agency One will be back tomorrow for another day of our annual virtual conference. At 11 o'clock, our virtual exhibit hall opens for an hour. Please visit the, vis the virtual exhibit hall where you can meet with Jim Williams and our other carrier partners, along with Agency One. We also have a booth. 
uh, and folks will be waiting there to um, speak with you about uh, anything that's on your mind. Some of the carriers are offering specific content. So uh, I encourage you to visit their booths. At 12 noon, we have a session on planning the pandemic and linked benefits. And then in the afternoon at three o'clock, we have a very special workshop featuring the empowered wealth concepts and how changing the conversation with your clients is sure to get a different result. We hope that you will join us tomorrow. Once again, thank you for your participation in our virtual annual meeting. Uh, we hope that we provided some value today. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Agency One if we can be of any assistance. Have a terrific afternoon. Thank you.